does Christianity have to say to a man whose back is against the wall? Yeah. Howard Thurman, an African-American clergyman and scholar working at Howard University in the 1930s, was asked this question by a man in India when Thurman made a pilgrimage to that country to meet and learn from the great proponent of nonviolence as a tactic and a way of life, Mohandas Gandhi. This man who questioned Thurman could not understand how a member of the oppressed population in the United States could be not just a part of, but a leader in the religious institution which seemed to him to fall right in line with the establishment that oppressed him. The message of Christianity which this oppressed Indian man had been hearing did not seem to be for him, the one who was oppressed. What does Christianity have to say to a man whose back is against the wall? The spirit of our God is upon me because the Most High has anointed me to bring good news to those who are poor. God has sent me to proclaim liberty to those held captive, recovery of sight to those who are blind, and release to those in prison, to proclaim the year of our God's favor. This is what Jesus has to say to those with their backs against the wall. In the Gospel of Luke, Jesus begins his ministry in the synagogue of his hometown, Nazareth, by reading this passage from the prophet Isaiah. When Jesus tells them that the scripture has been fulfilled in their hearing, these people who have watched him grow up from a small child are impressed and amazed until Jesus starts explaining what the scripture means. <laughs> they drive him out of the synagogue and out of the city. As Jesus moves beyond the generality of those promises to the particularity of what they might actually mean. So, what exactly was being fulfilled in the hearing of those who heard Jesus in the synagogue that day? Anything? If Jesus was the fulfillment of this scripture in the simplest and most straightforward way of understanding that phrase, then why do we read this passage and feel as though these are still things we are waiting for? There are still broken hearts. There is still mourning. There is still despair and devastation. There are still regions of Africa devastated by war. There are still entire communities, cities, countries in Central America without enough food. There are still children in India who lack adequate health care. There are still people in this very city who sleep under bridges and on park benches at night. Sometimes it seems that we are still waiting for this scripture to be fulfilled in our hearing. <laughs> but Jesus told his friends and relations in Nazareth that this scripture was being fulfilled in their hearing. So what is this prophecy all about then? If we were told that it was being fulfilled, but we still feel as though we're waiting. This passage is found in what is known as Third Isaiah. Most scholars agree that the book of Isaiah is a compilation of prophetic sources collected over a number of years. The material we have in the books of the prophets today would have been originally received as oral pronouncements, which were only later written down, either by the prophets themselves or someone close to them. And those writings were gradually compiled into the text we have today. As most scholars understand the process as it relates to the book of Isaiah, these chapters near the end of the book were almost certainly written down at some point after the fall of Jerusalem, which included the deportation of large parts of the population of Judah to Babylon. At that point in history, Things really weren't going well for the people of Israel. The city of Jerusalem needed good news. And these first four voice verses of Isaiah chapter 61 are just the sort of good news for which they would have hoped. These verses are the declaration of an anonymous prophetic figure that there will be liberation for the captive, comfort for those who mourn, provision for those who grieve, repair of ruined cities. Knowing the situation that the people of Israel were in when they first heard this text, we can imagine that this prophecy seemed like good news intended especially for them. While we must be careful not to read this passage from Isaiah solely through the lens of the gospel, the fact remains that of all the passages of scripture that a person like Jesus could have chosen to read from the scrolls of the Tanakh, the author of the Gospel of Luke attributes this passage from Isaiah to him. In Luke's gospel narrative, this is how Jesus begins his ministry. In this way, the author of this gospel designates Jesus as the one who has been anointed by God. And what has God anointed Jesus to do? Bring liberation to the captive, comfort for those who mourn, provision for those who grieve, repair of ruined cities. The people of Nazareth, who would have been attending the synagogue service and hearing this man Jesus, who grew up among them, read from their holy scripture, 
The people who would have heard or read the text of the Gospel of Luke in which the passage is attributed to Jesus were all living in a world where they were ruled by an oppressive force. This prophecy must have seemed like good news meant especially for them until Jesus reminds them that the good news isn't just for them, but for all, even those outside of their fold. Liberation for the captive, comfort for those who mourn, provision for those who grieve, repair of ruined cities. You know, while this certainly sounds like good news for the Hebrew people in their city, it also sounds like good news for us in our city. The prophet is voicing our own hopes, the dreams that we yearn for when we look at our world that is hurting in so many ways, ways that cry out for our response that we're not sure we have a way to give. So what is the hope that's being described here? These words are attributed to an anointed one, anointed by God. What is described here is the coming of God into the world. This is the vision which the author, the prophet of this text has of the coming of the kingdom of God. Liberation for the captive, comfort for those who mourn, provision for those who grieve, repair of ruined cities. That is what the kingdom of God looks like according to this scripture. If we think of this text as among those describing the coming of the kingdom of God, we have to look around ourselves and admit the world doesn't quite look like this yet. There's a way of describing the kingdom of God as already and not yet. We know that God is here. We just celebrated a week ago the Incarnation, Emmanuel, God with us. Paul's letter to the Romans assures us that nothing can separate us from the love of God. God is already in the world, here among us. The anointed one of this passage says, the spirit of Yahweh is upon me. The Hebrew word translated as spirit here is ruach, which refers to the presence of God as active, as dynamic. The Spirit of God isn't some vague presence that we can't quite grasp or make out. The Spirit is at work in the fulfillment of these promises that make up the kingdom of God. But the kingdom of God has not yet achieved its entirety. We just have to turn on the news or walk down the street to see that. The kingdom of God is already here, but it's not yet complete. So this is what is promised when God's kingdom of God is when God's kingdom is completed. Liberation for the captive. Comfort for those who mourn provision for those who grieve, repair of ruined cities. That sure sounds like Christianity for those with their backs against the wall, doesn't it? That's hope for the city, that someday all shall be well, all shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well. That's gospel. That's good news. Right? Except, then we see the hungry family in Guatemala or the sick baby in India, or the child soldier in Uganda, or the man sleeping on a park bench two blocks from our house. And all of a sudden, these aren't vague, hopeful promises that will come true someday. These are concrete, specific needs of our world, needs that we want to see met right now. (laughs) Here's the problem with acknowledging that particularity. It's scary. It's terrifying. We don't want to admit it, but it is. Because when we acknowledge that these are promises that our world needs right now, the next thing that we have to acknowledge is, if we know the world needs this, what are we going to do about it? (laughs) When we acknowledge the specifics, the realities, of promises we read here, it kind of stops sounding like good news and starts sounding like work. Cynthia Jarvis describes what we find of the kingdom in this passage as the in your face grace of God. Yeah, yeah. That's a great image, isn't it? It God doesn't tiptoe around the promises that turn the world as we know it upside down. Mm. The promise of the kingdom of God faces the world as we know it head on. When we start to really listen to the grace and mercy and justice of God that we find as a pervasive message throughout all of scripture, it's not just a feel good message that we are waiting to see fulfilled. These four verses found in 3rd Isaiah aren't just a prophecy. They're a mission statement. They're a job description. And the mission, the job, isn't just for Isaiah and Jesus. It's for us. When we read the promise of God as a job description for us, sometimes it doesn't feel so good. Sometimes it makes us uncomfortable. But why should it make us uncomfortable? These verses describe what we hope for the world, don't they? Shouldn't these promises make us excited and happy 
and hopeful. The comfort begins to slip away when we are forced to acknowledge how challenging the job description is. If this is our mission, it's going to be difficult, incredibly difficult. Knowing what we mean when we talk about our mission as Christians is incredibly important to being able to tell, and more importantly, to show the world who we are. Mission has often been described as our goal to lead others to the <coughs> salvation that we know in Christ, and there's nothing wrong with that. What we experience as members of the bodies of Christ should make us so excited that we want to shout about it, it should be so pervasive in our lives that everyone who meets us sees that there's something different about us. However, there can be a tendency to treat this world and the kingdom of God as two completely discrete entities mm. and to think of sharing salvation as us trying to teach people in this world how to get into the next world. Wow. Mm. Wow. Isaiah, on the other hand, blurs the lines between this world and the kingdom of God, especially with the verses we read today. Yes. The promises we have here aren't entirely otherworldly. These are God's desires for the human community right here and right now. That's right. So if God's kingdom isn't just something that we'll gain access to later, but it's also the reality God desires for us now. If the kingdom of God isn't just not yet, but is also already, then we are asked to think about how we might take part in bringing that kingdom to bear here and now as the real world. Scott Bader Say makes a powerful observation of mission that it is not something that goes out from God's people, but something that defines God's people. Yes. Mission is what happens when God's people turn their attention to those who are named as recipients of the good news. God has sent me to bring good news to those who are poor. The good news that the kingdom of God can be the real world, that these promises are not just for later, but also for today, must not just be something we share with our words, but something that we live out in our action. That good news must define us as people of God. The question asked of Howard Berman by one of Gandhi's followers, what does Christianity have to offer to a man with his back against the wall, prompted Thurman to write the book, Jesus and the Disinherited. In this text, he explained why he believed Christianity didn't have to be a part of the oppressive cycle, as his questioner believed it was, but could help to subvert that cycle. Thurman frames Jesus as the advocate of the disinherited, the poor, the oppressed, by explaining that Jesus was one of them, a poor Jew born under Roman rule. And his answer to those who were oppressed was not a huge army or a political coup with Jesus at its head, but a simple message to this inherited of their own worth and power. The message of Jesus is as simple as this, Thurman writes, the kingdom of God is within us. The already of God's kingdom is in us. The anointing spirit of God we find in this passage is active and dynamic in us. Amen. The hope, the good news for the city is in us. And yet, the question was still asked of Thurman. Truthfully, it is still being asked of us. What does Christianity have to offer to the man with his back against the wall? Thurman writes of the life and work of Jesus, the basic fact is that Christianity, as it was born in the mind of this Jewish teacher and thinker, appears as a technique of survival for the oppressed, that it became, through the intervening years, a religion of the powerful and the dominant, used sometimes as an instrument of oppression, must not tempt us into believing that it was thus in the mind and life of Jesus. He continues, it cannot be denied that too often the weight of the Christian movement has been on the side of the strong and the powerful and against the weak and oppressed. This despite the gospel. That's a hard truth to swallow, isn't it? That we might not have always gotten this right? But we're human. Do we really think God expected us to always get it right? No matter how many times we feel as though we failed in the task, we can rest in the confidence that what is named for us and expected of us in these verses is who we are capable of being. If we allow ourselves to acknowledge and feel that capability, we will be empowered to be who God intended the church to be for a city that needs good news. What if we read these four verses from the prophet Isaiah in our own voice? What if we were to make ourselves the speakers of these promises of the kingdom of God? What then would we do? How would we be different if we could only remember that act of spirit that is in us? that the kingdom of God is within us. 
The point is that the task, the mission, the job description in these verses isn't just for Isaiah and Jesus, it is for us. We are the members of the kingdom of God that the people of this world will see. And this passage of scripture describes what those people should see when they look at us. This is the mission that should define us as God's people. Liberation for the captive. Comfort for those who mourn. Provision for those who grieve. Repair of ruined cities. Let's be brave enough to claim this mission is ours in all its particularity in our communities, in our cities, in our world, we know those who are captive, those who mourn, those who grieve. We cannot fix everything that is broken, but we can reach out in our little corners of the kingdom of God. We can be the good news, the good news in our city, and we are called to do so. What does God offer to those with their backs against the wall? Us. Are we ready? Yeah.